The story that you are about to hear is one that has been, for the last 70 years, left to wither in the hearts of those who recall it. Of the 12 of us present that day, only one remain, and my own end is rapidly approaching. I am telling you this tale with shaky hands solely in order to console myself in my final moments, and I hope that anyone who may discover this will refrain from judgment upon me or my comrades until the day. I distinctly recall sitting in a tent with my fellow soldiers, just outside of Berlin, huddling around a shortwave radio and listening to the trials of our nation's greatest foes. They feigned insanity, but guilty gave harrowing accounts of every detail and every single crime committed by their hand under their watch. My favorites, however, were the ones who bled innocent. The ones who said, I was just following orders. I had to wonder what I would say had the war ended with Moscow under the Iron Eagle. What would I say if asked to justify my actions in war? I believe I know exactly what I would say and it would be the same thing as the men being jeered by the entire Red Army, excluding the ten of us gathering in the tent. You see, the two luckiest of us had already died. It was a quiet village in eastern Germany, December 24th, 1944. We were under orders to seek out any soldiers lying in wait to ambush the main column of the army. Our sergeant, Ivan, took the lead, the rest of us falling in line behind him. It was raining heavily, obscuring our vision, a sharp crack jeering my attention, and I immediately fell to my stomach. I smelled smoke and heard a thump in the dirt a dozen feet ahead of me. The sound of gunfire roared in my ears as we returned fire. We had no idea where the shot had come from, so each among us took our best guess and fired in that direction. We knew we would not hit the shooter, but we had happened to scare him off. I decided to hold my fire in order to cover my comrades as they reloaded their weapons, and when the gunfire stopped, I watched carefully the nearby houses. A quick movement by a roadside fence caught my eye, and I quickly shot off a couple of rounds at the dark mass. At least one of my shots must have landed, because whatever it hit fell to the ground, unmoving. And by now, my fellow soldiers had finished reloading, so I injected my magazine and I slid a new one in its place. We were still for a time, waiting for the returning fire. And when it never came, Ivan came up to crouch and quietly walk over to the corpse. He felt the pulse and then returned to us. Yes, we got him, he said. In his eyes, I saw something that I hadn't seen before. A kind of sadness and regret. No matter how much I pushed, he would not tell me why. We stood and casually walked over to the house where the shooter had come from. Ivan knocked on the door, and we waited for a moment, as Ivan firmly planted his foot on the door, rearing to kick the door down, and when a shotgun blast blew through the door, Ivan fell to the ground, riddled with buckshot. We returned fire through the door and then swiftly beat it down with the stock of our rifles. Inside, broken glass littered the floor and bullet holes scattered along the walls. On the ground was a young woman, shot fatally four times, and in her hand, the shotgun that killed Ivan. We had had more than enough of this village. We ransacked the house, throwing over tables and filling our pockets with valuables. And when we had finished, we threw gas lamps into the floor and tossed matches on the pooling liquid. And we left the house on fire. It was only once we were outside again that we heard the wailing, and by then the flames had taken a hold. And it was too late to re-enter the building. The mother had hidden her baby before turning to fight us and... We hadn't found it before torching the house. The wailing continued for just a few minutes before falling silent among the crackling of flames. A man burst from the building down the street and sprinted towards us, screaming in German. Our translator gaped at him, and when we raised our rifles, he held up his hands to stop. The German man shoved past us and into the burning building. He hesitated only briefly at the doorway before running through, and he didn't come back out. By the time that the fire had died, We couldn't see it anymore. The rest of our mission went by in silence, and when we doubled back to where we came, we found people in the street, staring at us. Some were angry, and some were sad. 
but most had just a blank stare. And I still see it in my nightmares. When we passed the house, I stopped. I announced to no one in particular that I had to take a leak. No one believed it, but that didn't matter. I stepped to the shell of the house that we had destroyed. And there on the floor in the bedroom, I saw the skeleton of a man crushed under a wooden beam, a smaller collection of misshapen bones in his arms. And in the yard by the fence, I saw a little boy with a toy gun, dressed in an oversized uniform of a German soldier. That night, we all had nightmares. The man with his wild eyes told each of us that he would be back for us, one after the other. The next day, we had laughed it off together. We had thrown ourselves into our duties. We had fought hard not to think about the screaming man or the wailing baby. And one by one, as the years went by, we died. Here, one of us fell from a tower that we were constructing. There, an aggressive form of cancer that suddenly appeared in the brain. Never obvious, but only suspicious to us. Because we knew. We all knew what was happening. And when there were two of us, just Joseph and I, he had come to visit. And when he had knocked, I thought my time had come. And I should have known that I would be last. He's coming for me, Joseph had said. It's my time now. I would have liked to console him, to assure him that it was all a coincidence, but we both knew better. And that night, Joseph cried on my shoulder, and I on his. I'm so sorry, he had sobbed. I didn't know. The next day, he shot himself in his apartment. And that was one week ago, and now it's my turn. I know he is coming. Every night in my sleep, he gazes in my eyes and smiles. Every night, he smiles wider. And last night, he began to speak. Quietly. So quiet that I cannot hear any of what he says, other than make out what he is speaking. I want to hear what he has to say. I cannot sleep tonight. I will stay up as late as possible. And before I sleep, I will climb to the roof and stand on the edge. I must. I cannot know what he will say. The shot at us. The woman killed Ivan. We couldn't have known about the baby. We were just eliminating the resistance. That's all. We were only following orders. Only following orders. Our downfall was our own fault. Our unending bloodlust and desire for arbitrary resources has dragged our species down to the ground, devolving us to savagery in the end. I would hurl my blame into the hands of God, but at this point I don't even believe that he exists. Hell, even if he did. I call into question whether a deity who would allow the self-destruction of his sons and daughters would be worth a prayer. And I keep asking myself why a being so all-loving would sit idly by as his own children suffered and perished. They can only find answers in sputtered coughs and ash. Immeasurable does not describe the level of fatality, and thus I deem it of utmost importance to document these events as a warning of what not to do if the human race is to miraculously prevail. Our steady climb into the inferno began on December 25th, 2025. In a morbid display of holiday cheer, scientists for the United States military formed a new substance with high potential for weaponization, officially titled Biotoxinochlorin. The substance was given the nickname Dropums as it would cause those in contact to drop to the floor in a state of paralysis 
as their skin proceeded to quite literally melt off the bone. The substance was rumored to be a mix of sulfuric acid, tampered cobra venom, lead, and a few other unknown binding ingredients, though the true contents were held confidential to the public. Dropham's most valuable asset beyond intimidation was versatility. They could be compacted into shells as gun ammunition or packed into bombs as a method of mass destruction. The creation of Dropham's ushered in a beginning of what we liked to call the Decade of Dread. As expected, this was a span of 10 years from 2025 to 2035. Although the U.S. government swore that they would not utilize drop bombs unless absolutely necessary, reports near immediately came in of the military sneaking the deadly stuff into battlefields, giving the country a dominant advantage in conflict. Despite the outcry of civilians across the globe, drop bombs eventually became common practice in battle, and although they were despised in concept, Nobody could deny that they were incredibly effective at bringing rival countries to their knees. And by 2028, the countries of China, UK, Japan, and Australia banded together to stop the US's reign of terror. The countries formed a faction called BRAP, Biotoxichlorin Removal and Protection, in an effort to even the scales. The problem with BRAP was that although their intentions seemed admirable, they were actually quite flawed. Rather than attempting to genuinely remove and protect the substance, they instead decided to attempt to fight fire with fire and simply ensure that the US wasn't the only nation with access to drop bombs, hoping the threat of retaliation would halt the state's conquering spree. By mid-2028, the US had already taken control of 17 other countries, all within a span of two years and oftentimes simply out of fear towards the substance's excruciating effects, as described by the seldom-found, horrifically mutilated survivors. The major territories that were captured and moved into the U.S. were Canada, France, Mexico, and Haiti, while the rest were smaller territories taken over only for their natural resources. And with reconnaissance from tenured double agents, BREP eventually found out the Dropham's recipe and began making their own Dropham artillery. Hell, they even made a drop em sprayer that spewed the substance into pure liquid form. In terms of warfare supplies, BREP was, for lack of a better term, stacked. But when they tried to combat the powerful US, they were oblivious to the fact that they were about to start what was considered to be World War III. On March 1st, 2030, BREP launched an unprompted attack on US soil. The BREP militia attacked San Francisco, and although they were breaking many of the Geneva Convention's rules of war, they slaughtered thousands. The U.S. Army was sent down to California, and they responded by massacring the BREP militia with a plethora of drop on bullets and sprays. It seemed as though BREP was dealt with after the U.S. defended California, but a mere year later, BREP used its first drop on bomb on the U.S. They attacked the city of Boston, and the bomb pulverized the poor community and all of its inhabitants, along with the majority of Massachusetts. Somehow, when the states swung back, they swung back harder. The U.S. dropped a DEP, a drop em bomb, in London, England, and sent storms of troops to raid, destroy, and pillage the rest of the U.K. The United States degraded to uncivilized tactics used centuries ago, all for the taste of sweet revenge. On May 22, 2030, BRAP proved that they were no better than their adversaries. On May 22, they DEP'd seven states, most important being New Texas, New York, California, and Illinois. At this point, what was left of civilization in the afflicted states was in shambles. Many other states were in complete chaos, leading them to branch off and create a new country called the Alliance of Liberty. Due to the rebelling states, the United Ones fell into utter chaos, leading even more to rebel and join the alliance. Because of this, what was left of the U.S. became a war country, focusing solely on constructing weapons and conquering resources. Their first DEP attacks were used against the Alliance of Liberty. Caught off guard, the alliance was dealt with rather quickly. 
leading many of the rulers of the states within to come crawling back to the U.S. The U.S. government responded, naturally by enslaving all of the deferred civilians and publicly executing their leaders. Blind with rage and fueled by revenge on January 4, 2035, the United States made another destructive innovation, but not one many would suspect. They attempted and succeeded to create a new disease built to ravage any countries that stood before them. The disease was called Excro and was tested on by those enslaved by the U.S. To the delight of the military, the disease had an incredibly high mortality rate and resulted in a gruelingly slow, painful death, all the while while leaving the enemy incapacitated. The disease had different effects on different people, though all were deadly. Some exposed to the disease would drown in their own vomit within minutes, while others' blood would boil within their veins and their organs for the most part would melt. The best thing about this biological weapon, however, was that it was extremely transmissible, and it was found to be airborne. From any study on the diverse effects, the government started taking random slaves or innocent civilians into testing facilities, in which they had cruel experiments extracted upon them. On such experiments had a subject pinned to the table by nails, before having their arms ripped out of their sockets and their freshly severed stumps injected with excro, and of course without any semblance of an anesthetic beyond a cloth to bite down on. There were many more tests conducted, and the United States' unquestionable thirst for blood led to the majority of the U.S. remaining civilians being tested upon if not killed outright, providing incentive for civilians to join the war effort and solidifying the territory as a military site and nothing more. Some sadomasochist over in the military came up with the genius idea of combining droplums with excro to create some sort of biological bomb. The U.S. government was euphoric upon hearing the idea and decided to give it a shot. At first, they were dismayed as the two would not mix. However, with some tinkering by some of their leading scientists, the homegrown disease and dropums were able to mix correctly. The first test subject for the bioweapon was the person who submitted the idea in the first place, and the weapon worked just as planned, if not better. This destructive combination became the most catastrophic weapon humanity would encounter, and led to what we would call the Age of Apocalypse. The U.S., enraged by BREP's attacks in the years prior, launched its first drop em and excro bomb, the DEP, in Hong Kong on August 14, 2036. And within hours, a scattered hailstorm of bombs rained, obliterating nearly all of China. Those unfortunate enough to have survived the explosions were infected by excro, which, without a known cure, would lead to their certain demise. Or so it was thought. After word had spread of China's decimated land, the UK sent investigators into the most protective armor available to inspect the damage. And to their shock, amid the catacombs of rubble and ghosts of households, wandered unknown individuals with tarred black skin and clusters of leaking abscesses displayed as red dots. It is reported that these boils would progressively inflate and pop, spreading excro particles and emanating a stench far greater than even the passive rotting of corpses, described only as inhuman. When provoked, the strange people went berserk and attacked investigators, bludgeoning them to a pulp by wildly swinging their limbs, seemingly physically unbothered by the disfigurement of their arms, elbows, and hands in the barrage, but crying in what could only be assumed to be agony with each crack. Their victims were eventually cannibalized, with some of the ravenous denizens even being said to have shed tears, which would only present themselves momentarily before evaporating into steam. Only a handful of the hundred investigators made it back to tell Scotland officials what had occurred. Within days, a fleet of UK soldiers were sent in to combat the strange inhabitants, and also search for any potential survivors. After hours of searching upon arriving, these soldiers managed to find a small group of survivors, all of whom had buried themselves underground within shoddily made bunkers during the explosion. Shocked at the sight of other humans, the survivors were haphazardly brought up into the polluted Chinese air and within seconds, all of them began coughing and hacking profusely before collapsing to the ground. Once they inevitably died of suffocation, the survivors, all in unison, stood up, leaving the soldiers to watch in horror as their skin cracked and broke away to form garish boils. 
as the former survivor's blood vessels popped within their eyes and their skin grew sapped all of color. The soldiers fled and ran for their lives, never again to return to the forsaken land formerly known as China. In an effort to get rid of all in the infected, the UK dropped a nuclear bomb on China, but the infected seemed to bask in the radiation and ran towards the explosion like moths to a flame. Those who weren't immediately vaporized appeared to quite literally dance with glee, leaving officials at a loss for how to proceed. The soldiers who returned to the UK were thought to be safe and were allowed into the public after a few weeks of quarantine. Unbeknownst to UK officials at the time, however, even coming into contact with those infected would lead to eventual death and transformation. Thus, within a few days after being released, these soldiers morphed into the strange creatures that they had confronted mere weeks before and spread their plague to the rest of the country. Words could not describe the severity level of this pandemic, and the center of it was England, so the UK had no other choice but to drop a DEP on the area so they could at least melt the disfigured monsters that killed millions, if that meant murdering the infrequent clusters of survivors. However, the attempts at ending the disease with dropums was futile, and those infected only appeared to become more feral upon interacting with the substance. Soon, even the British government and royalty encountered cases of infection, leading to anarchy and absolute chaos. The process in which people transformed into these disease-ridden monsters came to be known as excremation. The U.S., seeing what one bomb did to an entire nation, became mad with power, and in their eyes you were either with them or against them, and in both circumstances your country would still likely be destroyed. The next target of the U.S.'s wrath was Japan. Japan, luckily, was prepared for such an event and provided underground shelters for their civilians to protect them from the blasts. Unfortunately, when the inevitable came and the bombs dropped, the leaders of Japan weren't able to get to the shelter in time, and they all perished. Foolishly, and with few leaders to guide them, many Japanese civilians walked out into their fallen country mere days after the bombs had dropped, leading to their untimely demise. And in the weeks that followed, and without foreign intervention, the majority of the people still underground were found by what we would call extromorphs, and were said to have been savagely tenderized until the majority of their bones were shattered to near dust, then eaten and sometimes alive and kicking. The only remains found for many of the victims were their deformed skeletons, of which had been gnawed on and only had mere strings of flesh or the occasional scratched eyeball still attached. By this point, as the only country with contained and weaponized excro, the U.S. had just about every nation either conquered in fear or as a demolished wreck. The states next to their eyes in Australia, which wasn't so easy to be taken down. The Australian government already had begun construction of a safe underground area where almost all citizens of major areas could fit into and reside. The bunkers were started back up when drop bombs were first created just in case something like this were to occur. And when the bombs finally dropped, Almost everyone residing in or around any metropolitan area was safe and sound in their own little underground community. But there was one problem. The underground society wasn't completely finished yet, and thus to preserve space and rations, many innocent people were banished out into the unforgiving, polluted terrain of Australia. Another catastrophic problem was that not all the food had yet been imported, so the survivors still only had about a month before food ran out leading to the choice of either starvation or cannibalization. The Australian public chose the latter. Those who were weak, sick, or obese were eaten first. The higher class citizens getting first pickings. And eventually the cannibalization chain went down the line until only about a fourth of the population remained. Brothers were eating their sisters, parents were eating their children, and it appeared to be absolute mayhem. And in the end, many decided death was a more favorable option and purged themselves all of their wrongdoings by venturing out into the polluted wasteland that they once called home. Finally, America had done it. They had successfully eliminated all opposing countries and were alone in the world to prosper. Amid the brash celebrations decorating the streets of remaining states, petrifying intel turned the innumerable cries of celebration into guttural cries of anguish. Throughout the years, Australia had numerous spies in the U.S., many of whom were eventually made into high-ranking members of government. 
And by the end of the war, however, they had found just about every spy there was, making a message out of them by conducting inhuman experiments on them or performing degrading medieval torture methods such as the brazen bull or saw torture upon them. However, of all the spies found, the U.S. could not manage to discover the most dangerous spy Australia had, as he had already taken residence in a profoundly powerful sector of the government. Once word broke out about Australia's citizens being completely killed off and their country obliterated, the spy went insane. He made his way into the DEB, as well as the DEEB controlled area, and with his knowledge of the launch codes, set the remaining explosives the U.S. had in their possession to launch into or around all controlled territories. The spy was shot dead nearly instantaneously, but by then the bombs were already deployed. And just like that, the U.S. had sealed its fate. The problem above all for the United States was that they never had to worry about being the target of their own weaponry as they were always in control, and thus foolishly only had a few shelters for the U.S. citizens and themselves. But the majority of survival slots already filled. The American public and rulers alike watched in horror as the countdown to doomsday ticked. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. A thunderous boom was heard in the distance, and a cloud of soot and dust loomed on the horizon. And within seconds, the White House was engulfed in flames, and all inside were smothered in dust and ridden with disease. The world had fallen to pieces. The date is, I think, June 2nd. Mm. Wait, it's uh, June 13th, 2056. There are believed to be around 100 people still alive on Earth. And the only thing we know is suffering. For some godforsaken reason, we were all born immune to the disease, at least when encountered airborne, but not when consumed, leaving us perpetually danging on the brink of starvation as most food and wildlife are contaminated with excro. There are more cases of excremation every day, and it's gotten to the point that even the excromorphs themselves would rather starve than eat our frail, broken bodies. It grows more difficult to breathe every day, and as smoke and rubble slowly smother and suffocate us. I know I am nearing death's door. I can feel it in my bones. So take this as my final words, perhaps the final sputterings of humanity. If the human race unfathomably survives this nightmare, I can't say that we deserve it. Our unending desire for resources has been matched only by our insatiable bloodlust. I bared witness to crimes against the body, crimes against the heart, and crimes against the soul. These wars have proven fruitless. Our animosity misplaced upon others rather than on the issues that riddled our own nations internally. Whether this ignorance was found in security or bliss remains to be seen. Consciousness is a cure. The gift for which we've been condemned has drawn us to the inferno. And this hex ensures that even with intervention, history is doomed to repeat. Should we not recognize that when the world is inevitably brought to ashes... There is no use in parsing the gray from the silver. The Red Death had long been feeding on the country. No sickness had ever been so deadly, so great a killer, or so fearful to see. Blood was its mark, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and a sudden feeling that the mind was rushed in circles inside the head. Then there was bleeding through the skin, though it was not cut or broken. And then death. The bright red spots upon the body and especially upon the face of the sick man made other men turn away from him, afraid to help. And the sickness lasted from the beginning to the end. 
no more than half an hour. But Prospero, the ruler of the land, was happy and strong and wise. When half of the people of his land had died, he called to him a thousand healthy, happy friends and with them went far away to live in one of his palaces. This was a large and beautiful stone building he had planned himself. A strong, high wall circled it. This wall had gates of iron. The gentlemen, after they had entered, brought fire to heat the iron of the gates to make them close so firmly that nobody could open them. Here they could forget the sickness, the Red Death. They would leave the outside world to care for itself. Prospero had supplied everything they needed for pleasure. There was music, there was dancing, there was beauty, there was food to eat and wine to drink. All these were within the wall, and within the wall they would be safe. Outside of the wall walked the Red Death. It was near the end of the fifth month there that Prospero asked his friends to all come together for a dancing party, a masquerade. Everyone was asked to come dressed in fine clothes and with his eyes or perhaps his whole face covered by a cloth mask. It was a scene of great richness, that masquerade. There were seven rooms in which Prospero's friends danced. In many old palaces, the doors can be opened in such a way that the rooms like these seven can be seen at all at the same time. In this palace, it was different. Little more than one of them could be seen at one time. There was a turn every twenty or thirty yards, to the right and to the left, and in the middle of each wall was a tall pointed window. The windows were of colored glass, of the same color that was used in each room. The first room had blue cloth hangings on the wall and blue were its windows. The second room had wall hangings of the blue-red known as purple, and here the windows were purple. The third was green, and so was the glass of the windows. The fourth had hangings in the windows of yellow, the fifth of white, and the sixth of violet. The seventh room had hangings on the walls made of rich, soft cloth which was black, black as night, and the floor, too, was covered with the same heavy black cloth. In this room, the colors of the windows were not the same. It was red. A deep blood red. All the rooms were lighted through the outside windows. The resulting light was strange indeed, as it colored the shapes of the dancers. But the light that fell on the black hanging through the blood-colored glass was the most fearful of them all. It produced such a wild look on the faces of those who entered that there were few of the dancers who dared to step within those dark walls. In this room stood a great clock of black wood, and gently it marked the seconds as they passed. And when it was time to mark the hour, the clock spoke with a loud, clear voice, a deep tone as beautiful as music, but so strange that the music and the dancing stopped and the dancers stood still to listen. And then, after another sixty minutes, after another three thousand and six hundred seconds of time, of flying time, the clock struck again and the dancers stopped as before. Nevertheless, it was a happy and beautiful masquerade, and you may be sure that the clothes that the dancers chose to wear, their costumes, were strange and wonderful. The dancers looked like the forms that we might see in troubled dreams, and these, the dreams, danced softly through the rooms, taking the color of the rooms as they moved. It did not seem that their steps followed the music, but that the music rose from their steps. But into the seventh room the dancers did not go, for the red light coming through the windows and the blackness of the wall hangings make them afraid. And he who enters hears more deeply the striking of the great black clock. But the other rooms are crowded, and in them beats hotly the heart of life and the dance goes on until the last of the clock begins to strike twelve. Again the music stops, and again the dancers stood without moving while the slow striking sound continued. And before the clock was quiet again, many of the crowd saw that the first room, the blue room, there was a masquerader who had not been seen before. And as they talked softly to each other about him, a feeling of surprise spread through all of the dancers, and then a feeling of fear of sickening horror. In such a group as this, only a very strange masquerader could have caused such a feeling. 
even among those who laugh at both life and death. Some matters cannot be laughed at. Everyone seemed now deeply to feel that the stranger should not have been allowed to come among them dressed in such clothes. He was tall and very thin, and covered from head to foot like a dead man prepared for the grave. The mask which covered his face, or was it really a mask? The mask which covered his face was so much like the face of a dead man that the nearest eye could not see the difference. And yet, all this might have been acceptable. But the masquerader whom nobody knew had made himself look like the Red Death itself. His clothes were spotted with blood, and the mask over his face was covered with the terrible red spots. Or perhaps it was indeed his face. When Prospero looked upon the fearful form, he was first filled with terror and then with anger. Who dares? he cried. Take him! Seize him! Pull off his mask, so that we may know who we must hang at sunrise! Prospero stood in the blue room when he spoke these words. He sounded through the seven rooms, loud and clear. At first, as he spoke, some of the dancers started to rush towards the strange masquerader. They stopped, afraid. No one dared to put out a hand to touch him. The stranger started to walk towards the second room. He passed within a few feet of Prospero, who stood still, surprised. And while the dancers moved back from the center of the room, the stranger moved quietly, without being stopped, with a slow and measured step through the blue room to the purple room, and through the purple room to the green room, and through the green to the yellow, through this to the white, and then to the violet room. As the stranger was entering the seventh room, Prospero suddenly and angrily rushed through the sixth room. No one dared to follow him. He had a sharp knife high above his head, ready to strike the stranger. When he was within three or four feet of the strange masquerader, the stranger turned and stood silent, looking firmly into Prospero's eyes. There was a cry. And then the knife dropped, shining upon the black floor, upon which a minute later Prospero himself fell dead. The dancers then rushed into the black room. The strongest of the men tried to hold the masquerader, whose tall form stood beside the black cloth. But when they put their hands on him, they found inside the grave clothes no human form, no body, Nothing. Now they knew that it was the Red Death itself that had come into the night. One by one the dancers fell, and each died as he fell. And the fires died, and the clock stopped, and darkness and decay and the Red Death ruled forever over all. Thank you.